I guess you're watching this because you think you might want to be an independent researcher. I've been an independent researcher for over 20 years now, and people often ask me how I became an independent researcher, which doesn't help much when I tell them because it was an accident, really. In 1999, some friends asked me to do a piece of work to help them out, and I did, and um, people liked it, word got around, and I've never stopped since. The question of how you might become an independent researcher and why is a whole different question because clearly it's something you're trying to do on purpose. It's not happening by accident. So I'm going to give you my 10 top tips and you can see if you feel like they're going to fit you and your life. If not, then maybe try a different kind of career because there are challenges to being independent. But if you're the right sort of person, if after you've heard these 10 top tips, you're thinking yes to all of them, then really go for it. So the first thing is, you have to be able and willing to live on less money than you otherwise would. If you're highly motivated by money, I would not suggest the independent route. I do earn money and I earn quite well some of the time. I certainly earn enough to live on for my lifestyle. But I don't have a lot of what you might call expensive luxuries in my life, like um, maybe children. I don't run an expensive car. I don't have expensive holidays. I don't really have any expensive habits except perhaps buying books. But luckily those are a professional expense, so I can set them off against tax, but I still have to spend my own money on them. And that's an important thing to realise. If I had made a career as an academic from the word go, I would be earning considerably more now than I am, and I would have a much better pension provision and so on. But that's fine. I, I have no problem with the fact that I'm not doing that and that I don't earn that much because I have, in my idea, a much nicer life. So, you have to be able and willing to not be motivated by money, but you do have to be highly motivated. You have to be able to get out of bed in the morning. It's not just to do the research work itself, but if you're independent, you also have to do marketing. You have to do working on your business. You have to do your accounts. You have to do all these kind of things around running a business um, that are incredibly important. You can't sidestep them. You can't neglect them or you won't have the research work to do. So it's not 24 seven doing research work, it's also running a business and you have to be organized and able to get out of bed and get going on the day and do all the tasks, even the unappealing ones, with nobody telling you you have to, except for yourself. In terms of organization, it's not just organizing and working on your business. You also have to be able to manage multiple projects, to work on several different things at a time, to be able to move from project to project. You might be working on one project, but the phone might ring. It's a different client with a different question. You have to be able to switch from one to the other. Um, pretty much in a heartbeat. So that takes a lot of organisation and skill and record keeping. You have to keep really good records. So you have to be very well organised in that respect as well. Both financial records and client records, records of your time, what time you spend on which project. All of that is enormously important. You also need to do a lot of networking. If the word networking fills you with dread, you're not alone. It's really just hanging out with people though. And if you can do hanging out with people, then you can do networking. If hanging out with people is a barrier for you, then you really do have a problem here. You need to network online and offline. I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I also spend time on Facebook and Instagram. And when we're not experiencing a pandemic, I go to a lot of events, as many as I can, as many as I can afford the money and the time to get to. And I talk to people and I keep relationships going, and I take care to have coffee with people, to have lunch with people, to keep those relationships going, even when we're not necessarily working together on an active project, as much as I can, realistically speaking. It's also essential, this is tip five, to keep up to date with your field, and that can be hard to do, it can be easy to let that slip. When you're employed, there's a sort of natural keeping up to date as people talk about things in meetings and you go, oh, what's that then? I haven't caught up with that. And they tell you and, oh, right, OK, so that's happening now. When you're independent, you don't get that. You have to figure out what to read, which e-newsletters to subscribe to, which journals to subscribe to. I'm not really talking academic journals, they're too expensive, but professional journals in your field. And you need to read them, not just subscribe to them, but also read them or you won't be able to keep up to date and you'll fall behind and your clients will be surprised because you won't know stuff that's actually really important. And if you work across a bunch of different fields, which you may do if you're independent, then you need to try and keep up to date with all of them and that's even harder. I've heard it said that you should spend a tenth of your time working on your business, which would include keeping up to date and the other nine tenths working for your business, i.e. doing the 
research work itself. That varies a bit, but it's a useful rule of thumb to consider. One of the problems with independent work is that you can end up working all the hours there are. And that's not generally speaking so productive as working in a more focused way for less time. I used to work a lot of hours and I've pulled it back um, quite a bit recently. I wouldn't say I do exactly nine to five Monday to Friday, but that's my aim. Sometimes I want to take time off during the office hours, the standard office hours, to do other things like exercise classes or, um, you know, go for a walk. And then I'll work later on. And that's one of the joys of independent work is you can make your work flexible and you can choose for yourself when you work and when you don't. Make the most, most of your best times of day. But really, the more hours you work, the more your productivity in those hours is likely to dip. If you've only got a few hours and you know you've only got a few hours, you'll work smart, you'll work hard and you need to create that discipline for yourself. It's not easy, but it can be done. Looking after your health is vital. This may seem like a side issue because it's not about work, but if you are independent, you don't get sick pay. You don't get time off for being ill unless you create that time for yourself. And SOD's law indicates that your illnesses will always come along when you're very busy. Clients are understanding, but only up to a point. So you need to take care of your health. You need to eat well, exercise, sleep well, and tip number eight, take proper breaks. Really proper breaks, at least one day off a week. Proper breaks during the day, even if it's only for five minutes to get up, walk around, get away from your screen. And proper holidays, even if you can't afford to go away, a proper holiday from work where you do other things and give your mind a rest. And think very carefully about accepting unpaid work. You will get offered unpaid work. And when you're starting, it might be sensible to take a bit and a piece here and there, especially if it's going to raise your profile in useful ways. But really, people can take advantage of this and they say, oh, you know, it'll be good for exposure. Well, my answer to that is in these days of social media, I can expose myself perfectly well. Thank you very much. And another thing I think is um, I don't really get asked to do unpaid work that often anymore. But universities used to try it on. And I used to say, do you ask your plumbers to do this? If you have a leak that you need to fix, do you ask them to come and do it for the exposure? No, I didn't think so. So why are you asking me? Because I'm also experienced, trained and professional. And that would uh, make them pause for thought. And often, actually, it was people who weren't budget holders who would who would ask for these, this unpaid work. So if you're being asked to do unpaid work, see if there's something else in it for you. Can they pay you back in kind? Can you have a bit of mentoring or, you know, a bit of access to some journal that you might other not wise not have access to? Or access to an event. If they're asking you to speak at a conference, can you attend the rest of the conference for free? Um, or might there be paid work later on? Can you make it clear to them that you'll do this one piece of work unpaid, but if they want you back, there will be a fee? There are all sorts of ways. And really, I mean, when I want when I do unpaid work, which I do do, I want to do that for non-profit organisations or for groups of individuals who have no funding but are trying to do something useful in the world and can do with a bit of help. So think about the terms on which you'll accept unpaid work and then you'll be ready when someone offers, which they will, you'll be ready with an argument about whether you're going to say yes or no and you'll have some clarity in your own mind. And my final tip is to write for publication. Now I love writing, so I write lots of books and articles and so on. You may not love writing and you don't have to write lots of books and articles, but think carefully and make it targeted. Think about what you could usefully write and where. Where is there a good readership? Is there a high profile blog in your field and could you write a post for them maybe just even once a year? And then you'd have the link to that post that you could share on social media. People would find you through searching, would find your name, might look for your work, might try to employ you for work to do. Writing is great for your CV. It's a great advert if you can get stuff published, whether it's published digitally or more formally in a more conventional way. Even self-published work, if it's good quality and it's something people want to read. Maybe it's a short piece that you would self-publish and give away for free. I do this with my short ebook on starting your PhD, what you need to know. And that gets a lot of downloads. And in the front of that book is a list of all my other books. So it's a kind of an advert, although it's also a service to the research community. And really, I think that's a good way to do self-promotion, to make it something genuinely useful for people that's got your name on. And then maybe some of those people who read it will come and find you and ask you to work for them. So those are my 10 top tips. If that sounds like something that you could do, if they all sound like things you can do that you could make part of your life, then go for it because if it does suit you, it's a terrific lifestyle. I love it. 
I don't want to do anything else. And if that sounds like you too, then the best of luck.